Today we will be looking only at the first verse, but we will read the first 29 verses in our reading because it puts the uh, sermon in its context. So reading from Hebrews 11, commencing at verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand the worlds were framed, by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was Enoch, sorry, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs, of, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith... Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were assured of them and they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come, come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desired a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise, promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, that is, raise up his son Isaac, from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, sorry. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. 
By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry ground, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Now before we open up this text before us, let us just ask God to um, make his word live before us. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. It is indeed precious to us. In your word we find that we are introduced to you and we know indeed your way for us from your word. We thank you, Lord God, your word is indeed food for our spiritual souls. And so we ask this morning, Heavenly Father, that you by your Holy Spirit will um, make that word live before us, that we might have spiritual eyes to see it and understand it, that we might have spiritual appetite to receive it. Lord God, be pleased to bless us with these things and cause indeed these things to magnify your name. We ask that you will give to preacher and hearers alike unction from on high. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. This chapter, Hebrews 11, which we have um, re read a little bit this morning, is aptly referred to as a gallery where there are many rooms and each room depicts a particular saint's life of faith or shows the motivating force behind the life of the particular saint of God. Another way that I like to think of this chapter is as a hall of fame. We have in Longreach the Stockman's Hall of Fame and we have in Tasmania the Axman's Hall of Fame. And in these halls of fame we have um, depicted for us the prowess of men who have gone before. In the case of the Stockman's Hall of Fame we have the pioneers who have pioneered uh, pastoral industry. And in the Axman's Hall of Fame we have men that have, uh, uh, have um, equipped themselves mightily um, in, um, in chopping wood. But this, indeed, this Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11 is far more important and I believe that God has much to say from us from this Hall of Fame. Throughout the verses of this chapter that we've read today, there was a dominant theme and I'm certain that even the most disinterested person here this morning could hardly have missed that theme. Have you all got the theme? What was it? Faith. By faith. Before we go into the gallery, and we're not going into the gallery this morning, but before we go into the gallery to gaze upon um, the um, portraits of faith, the writer of the epistle wants us to see the motivating force that is evident within each one of these portraits of faith faith. And today that will occupy all of our time. Visiting the gallery comprises a whole volume. Why? I have borrowed from Troy a book of 700 pages by Thomas Manton on this one chapter alone. So we're not going to spend 700 pages this morning. But many persons, even Christians, use this word faith very generally and without defining the meaning of it. And sometimes this indicates their lack of true faith. Faith is one of those words 
uh, like love, good works, hope, mercy, peace, happiness and many others that are in the Christian vocabulary that we all too not that we all too often do not take time to define. And as a result, the words take on a wide and general definition and this often leads us to confusion and error. More importantly, this general use takes these words away from their biblical setting. Let me give you an instance of this kind of general use of the word that I'm sure many of you and all of you here have heard and many of you probably are using. We hear it said very often, oh, have faith or keep the faith. I've experienced the feelings of faith. All you have to do is have faith or never lose the faith. Well, then we hear it said, my faith carried me through. Now, we've all heard these loose expression, expressions, but the question needs to be asked, have faith in what? In who? Or why have faith? Keep the faith in what? Or who? Or why keep the faith? I've experienced the feelings of faith. What have I experienced the feelings in faith? All you have to do is if have faith. Is that so? In who? And in what? Never lose the faith. In what? Or in who? My faith carried me through. My faith in what carried me through? My faith in who carried me through? How did it carry me through? You see, this word is used loosely and seldom defined and such use is simply saying, have faith in faith, have faith in something, anything. You see, what it is really saying is, have faith in yourself. Many have faith in superstition, Gamblers do. Some have faith in some guru. Many of the heathen religions, they have great faith in some guru. Or even some of us Australians have faith in a gardening guru. Some have faith in a church, the Roman Catholic Church. Whatever the Roman Catholic Church says, whatever the Pope says, Many of the people that attend such a church would believe without any question. They have faith in the church. But then others would say, have faith in God, any God if it helps you. Never mind the object, never mind the reason, never mind the content of faith, just have faith. Well now the summary of what we've just been saying is simply faith in man's faith. That is faith in man's ideas, faith in man's experience and the result of this faith is that you believe just what you want to believe. My ideas are as good as anyone else's ideas. This thinking gives us no absolutes and ends up in uncertainty uncertainty in moral conviction, uncertainty in the truth concerning right and wrong ideas. And that's why we see homosexuals being made clergymen and even bishops today. Tolerance of all ideas and so-called Christian religions. We are told they're all leading in the same direction and sadly many of them are down to hell. This, this describes some of you here today, I'm afraid, and I adjure you to pay attention to the remainder of this sermon, as by the grace of God I hope you will see the error of this thinking, because this is not biblical, this is not the biblical definition of faith. My dear friends, today there are many, including those who claim to be ministers of the gospel, who teach very erroneous and pernicious views concerning faith. They speak of faith as if it is some man-made virtue. I have a, had a dear sister and um, a godly woman and she, she contracted ovarian cancer. She was in a church 
where there were people within that church that told her that if she could reach out in faith, if she could manufacture faith sufficient to reach out, she could be cured of that disease. And that dear lady, for twelve, nearly 12 months, prayed earnestly every day. She sought to reach out in faith. She already had saving faith. She already had the gift of faith. But she was reaching out for something that God did not have for her. She could not generate within herself this faith which she was told that she needed to do. And at the end of 12 months, on the last day that she lived, I was with her and we were praying. And it was very apparent that it was only at that point in her life that she realised that this was God's will for her, that God had, was calling her to her rich reward, that she was going on to receive that which God had for her. And she became aware that this was God's purpose in life for her. This affliction was, her, it was for her. Those who teach that faith is a man-made virtue very quickly deteriorate into a world of fantasy where all manner of nonsense is believed and practised. Why, well, I was recently given a book which had, was written by a man who um, was teaching these sort of things in the book. He was teaching that he could do all manner of things even raise the dead. That man was away in fantasy land. He was away in fairy land. It was nonsense because it was quite contrary to God's word. So we can't generate faith within ourselves. You see, the biblical definition of faith has foundation. It has content. It has results. Because you see, faith is the gift of God to all who truly believe. We have thus far been looking at, into the negative and, we, and, and to understand what something is, it is helpful to expose what it is not, especially when the subject is so manifestly misrepresented as this subject is in our day and age. So we come to the point of what is biblical faith? And I need a drink so I'm going to have a stick. So what is biblical faith? Well, the Bible tells us quite plainly what biblical, <coughs> what biblical faith is. In Ephesians 2.8, you will find the answer there quite plainly spoken. Ephesians 2.8 says to us, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Did you get that? For by grace have you been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God so faith is clearly the gift of God now from this verse we can see faith is the channel or conduit through which we receive justification from God but do you see that faith is not something that we conjure up within ourselves it is the gift of God and anything less than that is not saving faith and is definitely not biblical faith. Now I said a moment ago that from this verse we can see that faith is the channel or conduit through which we receive justification from God and I can see before me today that there are quite a few young folks and that expression, justification from God, is an ecclesiastical expression, although it is biblical, but I feel that it may be wise to give a little bit of explanation for the younger ones to understand what we mean by justification from God. It's just justification from God simply in a simple word, and I'm going to go a little bit more deeply into it than this, but it simply means just as if I have never sinned. And how that happens is that the Lord Jesus came as a child to Bethlehem, 
He lived a child's life perfectly without sin, grew into a man, lived a man's life perfectly without sin, came to the cross and gave his life on the cross. And in giving his life on the cross, he, he was there dying for his own sin? No, he was perfect without sin. You see, the wages of sin is death. And each one of us has the wages of sin, death, over us. And so the Lord Jesus came to the cross and he died on the cross for all who will come and seek repentance from him and seek forgiveness from him and cleansing in his precious blood. And then his righteousness is made over to us and our sin he takes upon himself and pays the penalty for our sin. And then it is just as if I had not sinned because God sees me without sin because my sin has been laid upon Jesus and it is, is removed from me as far as the east is from the west. And that's what justification from God means. Thomas Manton, the man that I just mentioned earlier, puts this another way. He says, Faith is the instrument of justification which receives Christ with every blessing. Well, that's a lovely phrase. It's a lovely sentence because it's concise and it speaks well of what this work of justification does. Um, and so he says that faith is the instrument the knowledge of the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ can only come to man by faith. Now the substitutionary death of Christ is what we've just been talking about, where Christ substitutes himself in place of the, the repentant uh, believer who's coming and asking for forgiveness of sin. If we're to use this instrument we must know all about this instrument. If I want to dig my garden, I have to take up an instrument, a, 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 a fork or a spade or something, to dig my garden. And that's the instrument that I'm using to dig my garden. But we're talking about this instrument of faith. So if we want to use this instrument, we must know from where it comes. We must know all about it. And that, my friends, is what is in the mind of the Apostle by first, as he starts this 11th chapter of Hebrews, as he writes this 11th chapter of Hebrews, he's there giving us something, an understanding. He's teaching us all about this instrument of faith. And so we see how he starts off by first giving a definition um, but before he give, can give a, a definition of these favorite, famous portraits that we spoke about, so let's look at his definition of faith. Let's come to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 1. And here we read that very first verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. What is he saying? He's saying that faith substantiates the things that we hope for. It gives good grounds to know the existence of those things that we are hoping for. It gives good grounds for believing the efficacy and the efficiency of the saving work of Christ on the cross. It gives the apostle here is involving our thinking with the working acts of faith. The word substance is also translated in the same word is translated in chapter 3 verse 14 where we, of Hebrews where we read for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence our faith, our confidence steadfast to the end. And this indeed if we do do that, is an anchor for our soul. If we hold fast the things that faith has taught us to the end, then we will endure. By this, 
we see a building of Christian life and experience. Faith builds upon previous exercises, just as bodybuilding exercises strengthen the physical body, so the exercise of faith in Christian living causes us to grow in the knowledge and understanding of godliness and holiness. Remember that old adage, use it or lose it. Faith here is not only looking out at the things to come, things in the future, and there is definitely a certain firm expectation and persuasion in the believer that the things in the future are present and they have real substance, even today. You see, I believe that I've been justified by faith and that that justification will carry right through eternity. Faith transforms the word of promise into continual fountains of blessing. How does it? When we believe, we're brought into a whole new relationship. We're brought into a relationship where we have other believers and this is indeed like a new precious family. You can see as you come into this place today how joyful and how thankful we are to have one another's company. But also it gives other fountains of blessing. It gives us peace and assurance with God. It gives us um, the blessing of being able to come into the presence of God with a full assurance of faith, understanding that God is waiting to hear from us as his dear children. Faith transforms the word of promise into continual fountains of blessing, as I've just said. Hear, the, hear what faith did for Abraham in the Lord Jesus' own words in John 8:56, where the Lord Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus. How did he see the day of the Lord Jesus? He saw it because of faith, the eyes of faith, not his physical eyes, not his understanding, his eyes of faith looked forward and saw Jesus on the cross giving his life a ransom for him, Abraham. And so you see, this was faith at work, reaching out 2,000 years. Faith believes, hope expects, Faith sees the object and hope runs to collect that object. Faith and hope are constant companions, although hope is always born of faith and anything less than that is not good hope. Faith not only unites you to Christ but puts Christ and heaven in your soul. Our Lord Jesus put it very succinctly when he said, in John 5:24, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from life unto death. You see, faith at work. Our Lord Jesus here is speaking of our experience, our faith at work right here and now not only looking forward to that which is yet to come, but Hebrews 11 widens, Hebrews 11, 1, our text for today, widens the definition of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, yes, we've just looked at that, the evidence of things not seen. What is evidence? We go to court and there's evidence placed before the court. The argument. So, there's articles that are brought before the court. They're the evidence. Things with fingerprints on. They're the evidence. Things that may have been stolen and retrieved. They're the evidence. But faith is has an evidence. And this is the argument or the demonstration 
Evidence is the testimony of an eyewitness, you see. And even in court, evidence is the testimony of an eyewitness. It's not something that we hear as hearsay, it's something that we experience. When we believe and are made new creatures in Christ Jesus, it's as if God opens the windows of heaven and pulls back the curtains and there before our eyes faith stretches uh, and into the, the windows he pulls back the curtains and there before the eye of our faith stretches the panorama of justification and this issues into sanctification. There the evidence is laid out before us through faith's eye and what a sight to behold. Is it not? Evidence of things not seen. Now, they are not seen either because of their nature as in the case of God and angels and spirits. We know they're there and we pray to God. Our faith knows of him and sees him in the eyes of faith but we don't see him physically. Then there are natural things such as gases and oxy gases such as oxygen and nitrogen and other gases. And we can't see those either, but we know they're there. Or because of their there are other things because of their distance from us, such as events in the past. We know that they're there and we have faith to believe that those events took place. Then there are other things not visible, such as answers to prayer. We don't always see the answers to prayer. But God does hear and God does answer prayer and faith believes this and leaves the consequences with God. So, you see, then there are other things that are not visible to us like the benefits of affliction. It's a terrible thing to lose a loved one. It's even, and it is a terrible thing to use, lose a loved one who's just a, a little one. But God does bring these afflictions upon his people with a very good purpose. God's purposes are not outside these things. These are the evidences of God to us. And if faith is at work within us, we see that these things have a purpose in God's plan. Gives us empathy with others who may lose a loved one. It causes us to see the uh, transient nature of life here. Um, with the case where it is a case of a believer, they've gone on to glory. Where it is a case of an unbeliever, it shows that those about might indeed be questioning where will I spend eternity so you see these purposes of affliction God uses through our faith so vis and then there are visible evidences of faith we've already alluded to the love and affection that the, that the believers have for one another and this is abundantly evident then there's the evidence of creation was mentioned already earlier in the earlier part of the service this morning. There's the evidence of creation which gives substance to the testimony of the Creator in Scripture. And only a poor fool would suggest that a primeval sludge could be responsible for such an intricate evidence. And if you're tempted to take this evolutionary theory seriously, listen to God's Word in Romans 1, 18-20. For it says there, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the, the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So if you're not interested in the things of God, you're like those that the next verse goes on to say. You're professing yourself to be wise. You know better than God, but you become fools. My dear friends, God's word here is saying to you, 
if you do not have biblical faith, if you do not have saving faith, you're without excuse because this evidence is before your eyes. You yourself are the evidence that there is a great God who is a creator and sustainer of his universe who has come to save his people from their sins. My loved ones, do, do ask the Lord Jesus for this gift of saving faith. He gives us the answer as to how we're to obtain this saving faith in Romans 10 verse 17 where he says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How attentive are you to the hearing of God's word this morning? Are you having a little doze or are you attending to God's word? I tell you, faith comes by hearing and if you're not hearing the word of God, if you're having switched off, Faith can't come to you because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Your prayer should be, open mine eyes that I may see, open mine ears that I may hear. But my friend, this is not the own, this is not a one-off thing. This is a constant discipline. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.20 tells us, and 420 and forward, tells us plainly that we must learn the doctrine or the teaching of Christ. And how do we learn the doctrine? The verse 21 tells us, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Are you prepared to be taught by the Lord Jesus? Are you prepared to come and hear his word expounded? See what I said there in Romans 10, 17? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see, this gift of faith is absolutely inseparable from hearing God's word. And this inseparable relationship between faith and God's word can no more be disconnected from each other than can the rays of the sun be disconnected from the sun. Biblical faith will not stand alone. It's just like living plants. It must be continually nourished. Hear the word of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 4, 4, where he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Faith includes not at merely the knowledge of God that God is let me say that again faith includes not merely the knowledge that God is but it also has the perception or knowledge of his will for us faith concerns itself to know how his will should be controlling our living you come to this place of worship today have you asked God to open your spiritual ears that you might find food and sustenance for your soul as you sit under the preached word? Have you asked God to take your voice and make it sing songs of praise that will glorify his name? Have you asked God to give you an empathy with the prayers that are being offered? And just as the the leader is, pray, is praying the the are you praying with them? Is it as if he was saying um, what you would have said? If it is, why don't you say amen at the end to acknowledge that you believe what he's saying? Not just say amen as any matter of form, but bring it from your heart. But this is not all. We need to diligently search God's word. God meets us when we give our whole heart to searching after him. Take, for example, the Ethiopian treasurer that we, we see the incident recorded for us in Acts 9.26. Here we see a man whose search after God had taken him many hundreds of miles from his own country and comfort zone to obtain a copy of the scriptures in his aid 
to aid his search after the one true God. But God sees that diligent searching of this man and God rewards him by sending along his servant, Philip, Mr. Interpreter, who faithfully shows this man the way of salvation. And so the gift of faith is born within this man. Because faith is born of God within the heart of a true believer, it takes, it takes and assesses the word that it hears and it applies them accordingly. It's not like the Roman Catholics that we spoke about before in their faith. They take the word of the church and the Pope as being infallible and take no more thought about it. It's the, it this is law. I must accept it because it comes from uh, such a source. But you see, that's not how biblical faith works. Biblical faith, it takes the words that it hears and it assesses them. It prays about them and it applies them as God shows it to them, to, to faith in their heart. And accordingly, uh, the, the word is applied. And this is expressed by the psalmist in Psalm 40, uh, verses, 40 uh, verses 10 and 11. Or Psalm 40, where the psalmist says to us, I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. You see, he's first, he's first assessed the word of God. He's first taken the word of God and he's assessed it and now he's able to declare it. I've declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I've not concealed your loving kindness and your truth. See, here we have a clear biblical definition of faith at work. And from this we can see that it brings firm and sure knowledge of divine favour toward us, founded on the truth of free promises in God's word. Free promises in Christ and revealed to our mind and sealed to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The historical death of Christ issuing into the plan of salvation, although fully documented, in the reliable record of scripture can only be appropriated by faith. Only faith can see God veiled under the curtain of human flesh. Only biblical faith can appreciate the depths of the substitutionary death of Christ. Paul is saying this to us in Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into the grace which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The more impossible it appears to human nature, the, the more room there is for faith. Well, my friends, are these working acts of faith, are they those which govern and direct your life? If they're not, you're deluding yourself to think you're a Christian. I venture to, to suggest that your faith is not saving faith. And in the day of judgment, you will be lost forever. My dear friends, let me put it to you this way. One who does not have this biblical faith will never be really happy to dwell in the courts of, the, of God. You may come to church, you may even partake of the Lord's Supper, but where do your priorities lie? What is your first love? You come to church when it's convenient and this gives you a good feeling but I fear it is giving you a false sense of security. We cannot be saved by this good work. Those who are truly born again, those who are experiencing this biblical definition of faith, will echo the words of the psalmist where he says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul longs, even faints, 
for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Is that the cry of your heart? My dear ones, this is the heart of a man who has who is justified by faith. Sadly, there will be thousands who have spent many hours in church, but their part will be their part and lot will be with those who are described in Second Peter three three, where we read, knowing this first the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? There are many today in Christian churches who have made their own rules. Yes, they've taken some of the rules from the Bible. Yes, they're happy to have a little churchianity. But their thinking is, we won't let it interfere too much with our way of life. But my friends, they're not really in the boat. Just as, just as they, they are just like those on the outside of the boat, looking in, like those on the outside of the ark. They will be, in the day of judgment, lost forever. They'll be outside Noah's ark, and they'll be lost forever. And those who have not this biblical faith, They'll be like those looking into the ark as the floods came, as the, as the judgment of God came upon the world. But they were lost forever. Would you be lost forever? Have you biblical faith? Now the question I want to ask you today, does your faith match up to the biblical definition of faith that we briefly looked at today? Let us bow in prayer.